everyone. Welcome to the Bradford Board of Trade Meet and Greet with the York Simcoe candidates for MP. Thank you all for coming out in this wonderful weather. It's wonderful to see such a nice crowd and thank you to the candidates as well. We're going to do a little bit of uh, testing of our microphones first. So I've asked our candidates starting here uh, at my left to introduce themselves very, very briefly, just name and party, please, so we can test the microphones. Robert Gertz, People Party of Canada. Matthew Run, the Green Party of Canada. Jessa McLean, the NDP. John, the Engineer, Termel, Independent. Vincent, Conservative Party of Canada. Sean Tanaka, Liberal Party of Canada. You all for being here. So we did do a draw for seating and speaking order um, just before everybody sat down and that's why they're in this order. Uh, we have invited the public to send us questions on our website and that is where these questions will come from. Um, I want to get right into it because we have such a large uh, number of candidates and a lot of questions to go through. Uh, what I also, who I also want to introduce is Dorian Baxter who has attended as well. He is also uh, running in your Simcoe for the Progressive Canadian Party, and please feel free to go and meet him. He's got a sign on his table at the back. So we're going to get right into it. We're going to start off with opening statements, and they have each candidate has two minutes for their opening statement. We are going to time you. I'm hoping I just came back from a week's vacation. I'm hoping you're not going to make me work too hard and cut you off, but I will do that if I have to. So we're going to start here with Robert Gertz from the People's Party of Canada. Robert. Thank you, everybody. I want to thank you and thank the Board of Trade for having us. Um, <clears throat> wage stagnation. 20 years ago, 30 years ago actually, I started as a Crown Attorney and I was making $30,000, $40,000 a year. That's 30 years ago. Do you know how many millennials I have seen and meet who are now still just starting after they've gotten one or two degrees and they're now burdened with hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt or 50 to 100 and yet they're all starting at 30 to 40 thousand dollars a year and then the question is where is the upswing you know that wage stagnation is one of the big issues but you can't legislate out wage stagnation Wages are indicative of the, the economy writ large. So the only way we can do, we can help the millennials, is if we allow for a creative solution revolution. Maxine Bernier was a man of incredible courage. When he left the uh, Conservative Party after only losing the leadership by a hair, and he said, I'm leaving because the conservatives are morally and intellectually corrupt. When he did that, he basically threw down the gauntlet and said, I'm going to create a new party for the people of Canada. His primary goal is to lower taxes and incentivize everyone to basically create the new economy. The new economy will be based on ingenuity and, and brilliance. The millennials are so brilliant. If we could just get out of their way, and they're uncorrupted. Robert, I'm going to have to interrupt you. That's the time. Thank you. Thank you. We are now going to hear from Matthew Lund. Uh, just moving my papers from the Green Party. Thank you, thank you. And, and thank you to the Board of Trade, and thank you everyone for being here. My name is Matthew Lund, and I'm representing the Green Party of Canada here today. Uh, I also am a member of the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, and I'm also a member of the uh, Advocacy Committee for the Ontario Chamber of Commerce. So I'm here to advocate for small business owners, for those of you that are. I'd also like to mention that uh, my roots in this city here in Bradford go back now five generations. For anybody that's lived in this community long enough, you know the name Gordon Doris Church. Those are my grandparents, and then anybody that would know them knows how much of an impact and how, how they helped build this community from the ground up. I want to continue in my grandfather's deep, deep footsteps, and I'd like to do that to represent you in Ottawa. My lovely wife and my two kids, we live in a hobby farm in the country. 
Uh, I've spent my career as a paralegal representing small business owners, representing families that have been displaced, and I represent the little guy against the big guy. I am here to advocate for you. And to dispel any myths regarding the Green Party, uh, we are the party that is fiscally responsible as well as socially progressive. We are the party that is forward thinking. We are the middle ground. We look at, the at universal health care as Canada's greatest achievement as a country and not just a financial burden that some parties might like you to believe. For all those that have lost faith in this corrupt system, I want to assure you that the Green Party looks at a holistic approach identifying the root cause of any issue. With full cost accounting, we are the party that is your source for economical and social freedoms. And when you're seeking a candidate to represent you in Ottawa, don't look at the flash of mythology of the status quo that you ping pong back and forth with. Look for change that will truly represent yours and your family's best interests. Vote Green for 2019. Now we're going to hear from Jessa McLean from the NDP. Thank you everybody for coming. So as we talk to people during the campaign, it's becoming clear that uh, all of us are affected essentially by the same issues. Unaffordable housing. Our riding has one of the worst rates in the province. We know there's a real lack of well-paying local jobs here. Many of us are struggling to pay for really basic things like medication. And our lake needs protecting, and we know we're running out of time to address climate change. Most of the candidates here will say that yes, they acknowledge that all of these issues are important, but listen carefully when they speak. There's not a plan amongst them. It's not enough to say we believe in climate change. We need to know that there's a bold plan in place to tackle it. And it's not enough to say that more and acknowledge that more needs to be done. Voters want to know what, what is going to be done. Because we know right now the system that we have is not working for most of us. But don't worry, it's not all bad news. Because we at the NDP have a lot of bold ideas and all of them are aimed at bringing our entire community up. We have a bold plan to completely transition away from fossil fuels while creating well-paying jobs, a green transition. We have in place a plan to provide pharma care that will not only ensure people don't have to go without key medications, but it will actually save our healthcare system money in the long run. And we have released a clear plan to address the housing crisis. And before you ask, yes, of course, we have a plan to pay for all of this. Our tax system right now favors the ultra-wealthy and allows very profitable corporations to avoid paying their fair share, and we will change that. We will close the loopholes, we will end corporate welfare, including fossil fuel subsidies, and we will transform our energy sector into a stable source of employment and income. So don't let doomsdayers scare us from what we know is possible, and don't let them tell you it can't be done. Listen with open minds and make a good choice. We move on now to John Turnell, the independent candidate. Well, last month the Globe and Mail announced that half of Canadians are 200 bucks away from being broke. Not you people, but your kids, okay? So, I'm going to explain why now and then later how to fix it. Canada's debt national had much stability till 1974 starts exponentiality. Same in Ontario, same in Quebec. Debt's doubling over time. Did debts all start to grow in big coincidence, sublime? The Bank of Canada once loaned to provinces and fed without the interest that causes budgets to turn red. It financed major projects, made St. Lawrence Seaway B, Trans-Canada Highway was funded Sea to Shining Sea. Not only infrastructure, it also paid for World War II. With interest-free cash, we almost nothing couldn't do. With only taxes for depreciation and repair, so easily affordable without the banker's share. But in 1974, Pierre Trudeau cut the fee, said no more interest-free loans for infrastructure need. All governments must borrow now new funds from private banks and raise new tax to pay the interest with bankers' thanks. But worse, in 1968, Care lifted the cap on interest from 6% to 60. That's the wrap. 
In 12 years, central bank rate rose to 22%. Remember that? More tax to service greater debt at higher rates was spent. So, oh Canada, Pierre Trudeau is responsible for debts out of control by lifting rate cap and ending interest-free loans his role. Oh Canada sure could have offered all a living swell, but Pierre in 1974 turned heaven into hell. So, I want to explain later on how we can reprogram the banks. Thank you to very much. Back the money time is up, sir. Thank you. We move to Scott Davidson from the Conservative Party. Good evening, and thank you to the Board of Trade for organizing uh, tonight's debate this evening. And thank you all for coming out on yet another wintry cold night in York Simcoe. The communities within the riding of York Simcoe have been home for me my entire life, and I grew up here, owned and operated businesses here, raised my family here, and now I want to focus all my energy and passion to represent you as your member of parliament. My family and I have been fortunate, however I am concerned about the future of our country and the challenges my son's generation will face. Challenges like securing a career, buying a house, and raising a family, all things my generation and those before me took for granted. These are the issues that have motivated me to run for office. I look forward to a constructive debate on the issues that you, the voters of York Simcoe, matter to you the most. Issues like improving the opportunities for small business to thrive and prosper. Issues like ensuring the health and sustainability of Lake Simcoe. And issues like making sure our riding gets its fair share of federal infrastructure investment. The current Liberal government in Ottawa made many promises after getting elected in 2015. And yet when I go door to door, most people are hard pressed to identify anything the Liberals have done that have improved their days, <coughs> day lives of people in York Simcoe. People know me, know me as someone who doesn't stop until the job gets done. I like to focus on the future and what can we do today for a better tomorrow. York Simcoe deserves a champion who will stand up to your interests. My name is Scott Davidson. And I look forward to earning your support. Thank you. Sean Tanaka from the Liberal Party. Thank you. Um, thank you to the Board of uh, Trade for putting on this event. And thank you for, for coming out and bringing us your questions. And in the effort of, of trying to earn your support. I'm a Liberal candidate, um, but that's not all that I am. I'm also a mom to twin boys. I'm also married to a man who also happens to be named Sean, um, in case people think I talk about myself in the third person. Um, I'm also a geography professor, I'm a local volunteer, I'm a lifelong resident of East Willowbury, and I'm also committed to representing York Simcoe. But public service isn't just about me and about qualifications. It's about advancing your issues and your interests. So I really do thank you for coming here tonight and making sure that you hold the people here accountable. Um, as a geography professor, I also know sometimes when, uh, when people call in sick to, um, to exams, what sometimes that means. And so I'm glad that everybody was able to make it out tonight. But that's why I've also been hard at work trying to earn your support and knocking on doors every single day, making calls and being out. Um, I've heard concerns about healthcare, about their long commutes, about rural issues and broadband, about families at all stages of life. And these are concerns that I understand because I'm from here and I live here. But we're addressing these things. Some of them are like the Canada Child Benefit, that over 20,000 children here in York Simcoe receive, and they can use that money as they best see fit, whether it's for nutritious food, or for sports programs, or after school activities. We've also strengthened the Canada Pension Plan, so now that there is more money when you retire, as well as making sure that the old age security was returned back to 60, 65 after it was raised to 67, as well as the guaranteed income supplement that that means that our most vulnerable seniors are being taken care of, as well as infrastructure, right? We, a lot of us, are commuting and it's difficult to move around York Simcoe. So we, I want to be your liberal representative so I can work alongside you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we're going to move 
right into questions. How we did this with our draw is our first question will go to Matthew Lund, okay? Um, I wanted to take a moment, though, to just thank some of the people that are over on my right. We are the board of directors of the Bradford Board of Trade, and we don't get paid to do this. We put this together because we think it's important. We're all business owners in this community, and we care about this community. So our first director, Brian Shapkovs, he is our vice president of sponsorship, and he owns Brian's Landscaping. He is going to ask the first question to Matthew Lund from the Green Party, who has one minute to answer. And then each of you will have one minute to answer. Thank you, Jennifer. First question. The small business sector is the biggest employer in the country. How are you and your government going to do how to make life easier for small business owners and employees so that the businesses thrive? Uh, thank you very much. And uh, so the number one thing that we would like to do as Greens is we want to cut payroll taxes directly. Uh, cutting payroll tax is going to make it easier for uh, employers to be able to pay their employees. It's going to be able make it a lot easier for uh, uh, employers to be able to uh, help guide their companies and be able to make a profit. So that's the first thing we're going to do. But we also want to try to incentivize. We're going to try to incentivize towards the clean energy sector. Right now, the clean energy uh, economy worldwide is estimated at $7 trillion. Now, while Toronto might be one of the uh, uh, best markets in the world, for clean energy, there's still a lot of space available to be able to do a lot more projects and a lot more uh, business with the clean energy sector. As a Green Party candidate, we're gonna uh, we want to skate where the puck is going, and that's basically moving towards a clean energy environment. Thank you, Jessa. You now have one minute. So the NDP is actually really committed to small businesses. We understand that they are the backbone of our community, and we have specifics in place that we are pushing for. For example, a hard cap on the credit card charges that most small businesses face. Um, we'll also put an end to the taxes that make it really hard for farmers and small businesses to hand down those, those businesses to the next generation. Right now, it costs, more, uh, it costs more for a family member to buy it than it does for a private person. Improving the infrastructure is also how we're going to help small businesses. Uh, not only will it help create jobs, but it'll improve the same systems that we use as residents. And overall, the best way to help small businesses is the best way to help everybody else, is to increase the purchasing power of your customers and your neighbors, right? We can do this by providing affordable housing, by providing pharma care, and in general, just raising up people's wages, right? The more money they have to spend, the more it's going to go into local small businesses. Thank you, Jess. John, now you have one minute to answer the question. Well, remember how the provinces and the federal government had access to interest-free loans from the Bank of Canada before 1974? Well, if you go to my website, smartestman.ca, and you look at the videos and the explanation there, I want businesses and citizens to have interest-free Bank of Canada accounts too, so that you can cut checks to settle all your mortgages and your interest-bearing debts, and after that, all your payments go against the principal, and someday you're out of debt. So I'm not just going to reduce and put a cap on the interest rates for your thing. It's going to be zero at the Bank of Canada, and whatever you need to settle your problems. So, what problems are left if the businessman has access to the interest-free Bank of Canada window like the governments used to have before 1974? The question now for one minute goes to Scott Davidson. Thank you. Every day I'm out knocking on doors, I meet with small business people who are desperate for a government that they want on their side. They don't want a government out that's calling them tax cheats. If elected, I want to be part of a new conservative government that does what it can at the federal level to help small business thrive. Small business, as you know, is the engine and the backbone of Canada and the backbone of York Simcoe. None of the public sector jobs or public programs would exist today if our government doesn't have the tax base from small business in the private sector. So this is what a conservative government will bring to the table for small business. Thank you. Sean Tanaka. Thank you. So one of the things that I didn't add to the list of things that I am is also a, uh, operating a small business along um, 
with, with my husband. So one of the things I was really proud that the Liberal Party did was lower the tax rate for small businesses from 11% to 9%. But what does that mean, really? What that allows us to do is put more money back into local businesses. It allows them to invest, to grow, to increase wages so that there's better paying local jobs, or to create new jobs right here in York Simcoe. So this is a real change that we have seen that the Liberal Party has delivered on. And I want to be that strong voice in Ottawa that continues to bring results right to York Simcoe and, and encouraging that these are things that we see that we can um, change the business landscape uh, for people not only in Bradford, but all across the riding. Thank you. And the same question to Robert. I don't know how they're going to do what they're doing. Uh, everyone's been talking, and that's what the Social Party has been arguing since Maxim created. The way to do it is get rid of capital gains. We are going to eliminate capital gains. How much richer would all of you be if we eliminate capital gains? Then we're going to increase the capital cost allowance. So basically, you write off purchases in three years instead of five. And then on top of that, we're going to lower the personal income tax of your employees down to 15% flat tax. The first 15,000 tax free. Thank you very much, candidates. Now I'm going to call up Jason Vieira from Tuffling Insurance, also on our board of directors, and he's going to ask the next question that will go to Jessica McLean for, uh, from the NDP. Are we allowing rebuttals? Everybody gets one minute to answer the question. Okay. Oh, Hi, so is, are we not having rebuttals through the whole debate? Everybody gets one minute to answer the question, and we start with the next person. So the next one will go to Jessa. She will get a minute, and you will all get another minute to answer the next question. So no one gets to talk about the question. No. You use your one minute for a rebuttal. Who is the first person? <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Not always the first. If elected as MP, you will have seven months before we are at the, poll at the polls again. Please reference your opinion on the idea that this by-election is a waste of tax dollars and what you realistically hope to accomplish in the short time before the general election in October. Thank you. This is an amazing question. Because what we're doing in this by-election is building some serious momentum. I know a lot of people think that there's no progressives out there, but every door I hit, I am finding community members that are on the same page and know that there are great possibilities. So this by-election is not only a chance for you to replace your MP and to send a message before October, but it's a chance to really be part of this momentum, right? We don't have to do the same things over and over again. So I'm going to use this by-election as well as the time in between win or lose to constantly reach out to my community and to build this progressive community that can fight for real change. And we wouldn't be in this position if Peter Van Loan had fulfilled his mandate of four years. This is what we trusted him to do. This is what voters elected him to do. And unfortunately, we are in this position, but I will make the best of it, and so can you. It's absolutely not a waste of time because every vote that comes out, even with a low voter turnout, that means your voice is amplified. So this is crucial. Anything can happen in a by-election, which is why I am very excited. John. Well, maybe you can learn something. Back in 1996, I ran against Sheila Cox in the Hamilton by-election. And the title was Super Loser Fails Again. But exactly one month later, the Hamilton Spectator announced that the Hamilton Self-Help Group started up a Hamilton Lance Time Bank. So I didn't need to get elected. I said, I don't need to get elected. I just need one person with a brain to go pick up the software and do it yourself. And there they did it. But no one's been smart enough to do it on their own since then, which is why I keep coming to explain it to you, even if it doesn't stay in the head longer than one ear to the other. And now Scott Davidson, the conservative partner. I'm thinking, no, everyone gets very excited about a by-election. I don't think it's a waste of money. Everyone's voice uh, gets to be heard during a by-election. I think it's very important. And in the short period of time, I will uh, hit the ground running. 
for uh, to become an MP for everyone in this room, uh, should have be chosen. And I think it's a referendum on the current Liberal government and how people feel about that at this time. And Shopton and the Liberal Party. I don't think it's a waste of money because people should have their voices heard. It's just unnecessary. Peter Van Loan was elected in 2015 to hold his place for four years. If he had held on for another couple of months, we wouldn't be in this position. We wouldn't be forcing you guys out in February to come and hear us, and we wouldn't be wasting taxpayers' dollars on something that was unnecessary. But here we are. And so, yes, my first order of business would be working alongside the federal government, the cabinet, the prime minister, to finally bring things back to York Simcoe and deliver real results. We don't need somebody in this short period of time to go to fight the government or protest the government. What we do need is somebody that can work productively, effectively, um, and efficiently and collaboratively with the current government so that we can finally make sure that we are bringing positive results and real change here. Thank you, Sean. Robert. Everyone, let's get down to it. There is no left, there is no right. There's just the haves and the have-nots. And with this by-election, you and the people, we the people, we have been betrayed so many times. We're on the course for a $1.1 trillion deficit. Who's going to pay for that? They're going to come after you to pay for it. The solution is to send a lightning bolt to Ottawa with this by-election. If you send the People's Party of Canada to the uh, Ottawa, you will send a message to both the Liberals and the Conservatives. We're not to be betrayed anymore, and we are not just taxable drones. Uh, it's kind of been touched upon here with Peter Van Loon. He didn't have, he had a commitment, he didn't fulfill it. And, you know, if you really look at the landscape right now, uh, you know, it's Andrew Shears, the new conservative leader. But uh, you'll see a lot of conservatives, or not, I shouldn't say a lot, but there have been a number of conservatives across Canada that have been leaving the MP post. It seems to me like the uh, that Andrew Shears is looking to clean house for a group of conservatives that are going to raise their hand for whatever he says. I hear I, the people of uh, York Simcoe need somebody that can actually represent them. I can represent constituents here in York Simcoe rather than just my party. Vote Green for 2019. Our next question, question number three, is going to come from another one of our directors of the Brown Court of Trade. This is Jackie Kozak, and she is from Scarioke Entertainment, who is also providing us with our sound services tonight. Thank you very much, Jackie. Oh, there we go. I'm on this side. Question number three. Thank you. Uh, this question comes from the, a grandparent who is concerned with the climate change. Will climate change will still be a problem for generations to come? What does your party promise to do to tackle this problem? Okay, well, he's Justin Trudeau leading fight to stop our climate change, cause CO2 pollution, carbon tax he will arrange. But in 2009, the frauds exposed in Climate Gate, where Michael Mann used trick to hide decline since 98. Won't show the court his data to his hockey stick graph clear, caught fudging numbers so the warmer times would disappear. Medieval warming period, 800 years ago, Greenland was green, and Britain even able grapes to grow. His hockey stick omits four centuries of higher climbs, hotter climbs, and uh, hides even the recent Dust Bowl days of dirty 30s times. Well, with scientists to hit decline, hide their data too. Uh, till Greenland's green again, we must consider what we knew. Still fooled by trick to hide decline. Still, Justin leads the way. I tried to stop climate from changing on his resume. Thank you. Uh, let me be clear on this. I believe that climate is changing, and I believe in uh, that we have a changing planet, and we have to take it very seriously. 
But one thing I can tell you under conservative government, we won't have a carbon tax. The Liberals have you believe that a massive tax on practically everything to fight uh, climate change, and that is not the way forward. For our party, we are going to have a climate change um, program and that you'll have plenty of time before the general election to evaluate. But we will not have a tax scheme that's going to put the cost of everything up in the economy. And you can see the premiers right now in Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, Ontario, everyone is concerned about the cost of everything, whether it be heating oil, propane, natural gas that we all heat our house with. We have to take a balanced approach to climate change to make sure that it doesn't hurt in small business or Thank people you are. Thank you. Sean Tanaka from the Liberal Party. Thank you. So I'll jump right in because obviously we don't have time for a rebuttal, but it's it's really rich to hear somebody that they're taking climate change seriously and asking you for to wait for six months before they give you a policy. So what I will tell you is about the Liberals' position on this. I'm I have children in this writing. I grew up in this writing. It's beautiful. I am not prepared to allow us to kick the can down the road and have it uh, be the responsibility of our children and our grandchildren to deal with. And so we need to put a price on pollution. When pollution is free, there's simply more pollution. But we have to do it in a way where we allow Canadians to adjust to this new reality. So what we have done is put a price on pollution that puts more money back in the pockets of 8 out of 10 families. It also allows them to adjust to it by getting this rebate up front before anything gets put into place so that we can make these changes. And in York Simcoe, because it's a rural riding, we're doing a 10% top-up. Thank you. Robert, you have one minute. Climate change is real, but the problem is, how are we going to do it if we're all broke? The situation is this, we're being taxed so much now that the wages are not compensating for the taxes we're getting. The only solution is not to have multiple politicians trying to fix uh, the environment or healthcare at the same time. We have to have accountability. We have to allocate who's going to look after what. Should Ontario be allowed to dictate to BC what their climate uh, agenda should be? No, because we're bigger, no. We need to lead by example for Ontario. The People's Party under Maxine Bernier would simply say this, listen, Ontario government, do what you must to protect your, your, your climate. Do what you must to protect um, your healthcare system. But we're gonna give the money back to the people so that you can hold the provinces accountable for the environment. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Ben. So, and I think all the parties up here would agree that in terms of climate change, the Green Party does have the strongest policies on green solutions and there's nobody that would be able to do a better job of cleaning up climate change. This is the defining issue of our generation. This is, uh, we need a livable planet, not just one for the 1%. Ask yourself, what is the cost of doing nothing? We have the opportunity to produce huge amounts of clean energy, solar, wind, geothermal, hydro, instead of the very dirty energy, uh, of fossil fuels. The dirty thing is the cheaper thing to do, and while it might seem like a better deal in the short term, market failure happens when you can't externalize your cost. So to Scott, who is sitting there saying that our climate change is our plan is coming, well, you know, I believe that when I get to see Donald Trump, Trump's taxes as well. But if you need help drafting your legislation, I got a book for you, Global Warming for Dummies. <laughs> Okay, in all seriousness, I think it's clear that we're lacking some serious, some real leadership in this room and in our, our federal government. Uh, believing in climate change isn't enough. Notice that the Conservative to my left and his leader, Andrew Scheer, have not acknowledged that climate change is human caused. So we still have no idea how they're going to adjust. And all this bickering back and forth about whether or not we can afford the carbon tax is simply a distraction from the real reality that neither the Liberals or the Conservatives have a plan. Pricing, uh, putting a price on carbon is just a small portion of what we know we need to do to adjust to climate change. 
And the NDP is the only party that has a clear plan. We will transition away from fossil fuels by diversifying our economy that's right now based on a very volatile resource that we know is ending. To pump billions of dollars into pipelines like Trudeau is doing is not how you transition away from fossil fuel. He's now committed us to further years of drawing this dirty oil out of the ground and, like the Conservatives, still haven't put forth a clear plan. Thank you, Jessica. We're going to move on now to another question. This question is going to come from David DiBartolo of Manulife. He is also on the BBT Board of Directors. David. Good evening, everybody, and fellow candidates. This is a question for your fellow. One that I like, actually. Scott. To Scott, okay. The 400-404 bypass has been talked about for years here in Bradford. It is a fix that residents feel will ease local traffic and congestion. What can your party do to help it become a reality? Scott, you have one minute. Thank you. Uh, it's very important to me infrastructure's dollars to come into York Semco. Most people now are saying, Scott, we are in a $20 billion deficit. Where did all the money go? At the end of the day, this is your tax dollars. So we have to see federal tax dollars flow here, and the Bradford Bypass is a, is a critical piece of that infrastructure that has to be done. When I'm in the town of Georgina, people always ask me, Scott, what's going on on the other side of the lake? We have to be able to join Bradford and Georgina and East Willowbury together and share in the commerce for business and for the movement of people and goods. It is very important and it will be a priority of mine. Thank you. So we've had a Conservative MP here that had very high profile positions in Cabinet that hasn't been able to deliver the Bradford Bypass. Um, what we do have is a Liberal government that has made infrastructure a national priority. When I was talking with the Minister about infrastructure, this was one of the concerns that I brought to him. We're also making sure that there is infrastructure to get around. So there has been investments now that we will see real change to the Bradford West Glenberry Go Station as well as the East Glenberry Go Station. So those are real dollars and real differences that we are feeling in York Simcoe. So I agree that we do need to make sure that this is a priority, that we're able to work collaboratively across the different levels of government, but also to make sure that there we have made the Liberal Party infrastructure and growth a top national priority. I want to be that progressive voice that goes to Ottawa to make sure that we bring those monies back into our writing so that we can deliver real results like the Bradford Bypass. Thank you. I'm sorry, but no. The, the, the bypass is a great idea, but it's not a federal issue. This is how we got into a $19 billion deficit. This is how we're going to hit a $1 trillion debt. And guess who's going to pay it? You guys are later. If, we, if the feds get into every area, in every region, in every province, guess what? You're going to be basically subsidizing all the other bypasses. No, the way to, we, we have to get our house in order. We have to get the deficit down to zero. Maxine Bernier will do it in two years, and I'll tell you in the next question how he's going to do it, but you can't keep turning every issue into a tri-government issue. Otherwise, you have no accountability, and you don't know who to blame. The feds point at the province, the province points at the feds, and then the, and then the city gets involved. And in the end, they all take a little bit more money out of your pocket. No, it's not a federal issue. That's good. That's good. That's good. All right, so I need to agree with my uh, friend here, but unfortunately he is correct. This is a provincial issue, not a federal issue. So not really many of the uh, candidates up here can do anything. Except for me, because I am on the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, and as a, 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 the, uh, on the advocacy committee for the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, this is one of our number one issues to actually get the funding from Doug Ford. I am actually scheduled to go before Doug Ford in August to actually try to get the funding to get this to happen. This is a number one priority for the Chamber. This is a number one priority for the citizens of York and Simcoe. We need to get this pass done. So I am actively working to get this done for you. Instead of getting it pushed off to what Ford said, 2030 or something like that. It was 
really at the bottom of the list, but we're trying to get this done for you now. Thank you. So the NDP has come out, we are fully committed to strong infrastructure spending. Yes, this is a provincial issue, but we can make it easier by providing the funds. However, you've heard the same thing from the Liberals and the Conservatives, but I would ask them, if they're not willing to raise taxes on the rich and successful corporations, how are you going to afford all of this influx in infrastructure spending? Maybe it will be the middle class taxes, because it, the Conservatives just tried to pass a motion to not raise taxes at all on the top earners. So, I mean, if they're not willing to be bold in terms of collecting revenue, don't let them be bold with their promises of spending. How would I fund the Trans Bradford Highway? Gee, how did they fund the Trans Canada Highway before 1974? Bank of Canada loans, interest free to the Ontario government. That's why their taxes were so low. They didn't need to raise taxes to pay interest on the debts these people would make borrowing money from private banks. So, if we can reprogram the Bank of Canada to operate like they did before 1974, you could have the funding interest free. But in the meantime, anything they do do, they're going to stick you with the interest for it, and you had a chance to skip the interest, so you deserve it. <laughs> Thank you very much, candidates. Our next question uh, goes to Sean Tanaka from the Liberal Party. And I am going to ask this question. I'm Jennifer Harrison, and I'm a small business owner here in the community as well. And I am the Vice President of PR for the BBT. So I'm also going to open this question up for a two-minute answer, because I think it could become a little bit involved. What do you believe are the top three policy priority areas that the federal government can implement to make positive change in the writing of York Simcoe? Sean, you have two minutes. Okay, great. Okay, so I would say families at all stages of life, infrastructure, and jobs. When I'm talking about families, I'm talking about supporting local families right here. We're starting to do that already with the Canada Child Benefit. 20,000 children in York Simcoe benefit from this tax-free um, benefit, and as well as strengthening the Canada Pension Plan. We strengthen that so that there is more money when you retire, as well as reducing the age of old age security back down to 65, when the Conservatives raised it, raised it to 67 and also increasing the guaranteed income supplement for our most vulnerable seniors. I think infrastructure is also very important, particularly in Bradford. We need to make sure that people can move not only around um, the riding, but also for those that are commuting. And we're starting to see that as well, with $1.8 billion that has been put into the um, Barry Go train line. And I'm sure that that will have several improvements that um, affect the GO train stations right here in Bradford as well as East Fulbright. Um, and that's a start. As well as jobs, we have the lowest unemployment rate that we've seen in 40 years. The creation of now that we're into um, February, 900,000 jobs that were created. And some of that is also in part to do with the fact that we are growing the economy. We are investing in Canadians, and it is putting more money back in the pockets of Canadians and lowering small business tax that allows for this job creation. And so I want to make sure that we continue on this, because while the Liberal government has delivered on these results, there's always more that we can do. There's always more that we can push. And one of the things that we've lacked here is a local voice. We haven't had somebody advocating for us. Thank you, Sean. That's two minutes. Thank you. So you need to go with that. I think Robert, we're going to move to you. Two minutes. The way to save York Simcoe and make it prosper is through innovation. You've got it. When I said it to you a few minutes ago, you had to agree. Getting rid of the capital gains tax, how much money would that put in all of your talk? into your pockets. Lowering up to all salaries to a flat tax of 15% will again spur the economy. 
15% is for the 15 to 99,000, and then from 100,000 up to 200, we'll do a flat tax of 25%. Then the corporate income tax will also be flat and lowered from 15 to 10%. They should, yeah, one of the accusations was nobody had a plan. I've now given you the plan. It's in our uh, website. It's how we're going to save all of Canada. A, a, a runaway deficit and a, a debt in, a, in the trillions, and that's just for the federal government, is not in your interest. That doesn't even include the province's debt and their interest. If we go back to the fundamentals, which is accountability, and saying no to some people, we can at least save all of us. Now, uh, the, the, um, the issue I want to bring up is this nonsense about, oh, how strong our jobs are. You know that's not true. I wrote a book about the fallacy of statistics. And I can tell you that you know that the jobs that are out there are soft. They're contract jobs, they're part-time jobs, they are not career jobs. And those are the jobs that are left for the millennials, and this is what, we're going to starve them. The millennials are our future. Let's get rid of the, the capital gains tax, let's put that back into business, and let's start teaching them, and let their genius show us the future. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so, again, climate change has got to be the number one issue in this entire election for everyone. It's the, it's the number one issue worldwide. Um, and per, as specifically as it pertains here to York Simcoe, uh, the, the millions of gallons of chemicals that are dumped into Lake Simcoe every year, this needs to stop. We need to clean that lake up. We need to get back to our natural resources here. We need to uh, invest in also into the agriculture as well here, uh, specifically as the Holland Land, into the Holland Landing. It's one of the economic backbones of this riding. Um, beyond that, uh, universal health care is, is, a, is a huge pillar in the, uh, in, in the Green Party platform. We look to preventative health care rather than reactive health care. You can spend all the millions of dollars you want in trying to react after an, uh, uh, something has happened to you. But wouldn't it make much more sense to spend thousands of dollars to prevent it from ever happening in the first place? This is just a simple thing of logic. Something as simple as universal pharmacare. You really want to sit there and have to decide between uh, getting your cancer medication or paying your mortgage. This is something that the Greens were the only party in the 2015 election that actually had universal pharmacare on their platform. I'm glad to see some of the parties have actually started to catch up on this. Um, then uh, on top of that, the next uh, pillar for us in this next election is also going to be the economic inequality of uh, the rich to the poor, the one percenters. Uh, we need to bring corporate taxes back to the, just even the level they were in 2009. We're leaving close to $40 billion on the table every single year by not taxing corporations as they should. I'm not talking about going and taxing them into oblivion. Tax them the exact same way they were in 2009 before you know, the, uh, the Harper government just started flattening all the taxes away from the uh, corporations and handing out oil subsidies. We need to do this so that we can actually start to create jobs. We need to incentivize the clean energy jobs. For every million dollars that is invested in oil, you create two jobs. For every million invested in Thank energy, you, Matthew. 15 jobs are created. Jessa McLean. Thank you. So if you take a look at the literature we've provided at the back, you will see my three priorities and they have not wavered because that's what I'm hearing from the residents when we go door to door. Affordable housing. We're getting priced out of our homes and our apartments. Our rentals have gone up 52% while our wages have only gone up 11. You can only imagine what this is doing to people. We will provide cooperative housing and we will make sure that housing is listed as a human right. This will help guide for future legislation. Pharmacare. I spoke to a lady named Bev. Two members of her family are, she's close to losing her home because two members are now relying on daily medications that they can't afford. We don't have to let this happen. We are a very rich nation and the investments we make in Pharmacare will in turn save our healthcare system money. And of course, climate change. 
Again, the NDP is the only party with a laid out clear plan to transition us completely from fossil fuels. It is possible, but we need you to do it. We need you to know that it's possible and vote with your values. We hear the Liberals talking about tax credits and really resting on all of the things that they have already done, but they have not said one thing that they will do in the future. Not one thing. That's insulting to you voters to try to just imagine to rest on our last four years, knowing that inequality has skyrocketed, that our, our riding has affordable housing rates that are the worst in the province. We deserve so much better. Uh, and the NDP is the only party that can provide the things that I'm talking about. Thank you. John. Well, I'm trying to stop financial waste, and that's why there's no way I'm going to do anything about global warming until green land's green again. And that's why I'm proud to say I'm the smartest man on earth, and these people aren't on the same side of the bell curve as I am. I was teaching a system of Canada's only mathematics of gambling course after a systems engineering degree. Same education as Mr. Spock, which is why I can bet I'm right and these clowns are wrong. Why did he change the name from global warming to climate change? From up to both ways. Why? Why did he change the name? It's still measured in degrees. You're being scammed. I can't be scammed. I'm too sharp. And of course, the slows can. That's why these five slows are up here talking about wasting your cash on carbon taxes. Number two, again, the interest rates. Wow. Uh, our taxes disappeared since over 40 years ago for interest on Trudeau's debt. We didn't have to owe. If we got back $2 trillion taxed since Pierre helped banks us fleece, Reversing algorithm gets back 60 grand a piece. So your kids would all have 60 grand in the bank instead of being 200 bucks shy of broke. So while Justin could make loans again without the usury, can we expect but more bad fruit from father's crooked tree? An engineering dropout, beta boy, go blooded blue, like dad a silver spooner with for numbers talents few. If Mr. Spock could act computer central all alone, Debug bad code to save a planet from the danger zone. No help he needed from the low-tech slows who had no clue. What Mr. Spock could do, the engineer says, I can do it too. 60 grand in your kids' accounts instead of being 200 bucks away from broke. And Scott Davidson from the Conservative Party. Thanks very much. Uh, one of my main focuses would be on small business for the riding. Small business is a, a huge economic uh, driver for the economy. And what you hear when you go door to door is that there's small business people holding on by their fingernails. They've reached out and they said, Scott, you've got to help us. We're, we're overtaxed, we're on a slim thread, and this is something that we have to look at very closely. You know, when you go into Bradford and you talk to uh, farmers, they say, Scott, it shouldn't take us three years to get permits to build a greenhouse. People's business model can change in that period of time. So that's one focus uh, that would be mine. That leads to less uh, youth unemployment and more job creations with more small business. Also in infrastructure. And when I say infrastructure, it's not just the Bradford bypass. It's, it's reaching out with internet providers as well, and internet in rural areas. There's farmers now that their business models rely on good internet. They also say, Scott, we're burning propane. We need help with that to get clean natural gas so we can save some money. And also, we have a lot of farms now still on phase one hydro, and uh, they're reaching out and asking for those things. And lastly would be my focus on uh, Lake Sebco. We need to bring back the Lake Simcoe uh, cleanup fund, and that is a very important uh, lake to all of us. This is where we all live, work, and play, and uh, that would be a priority to me to keep uh, Lake Simcoe clean for all of us, especially with the First Nations on Georgian Island that still relies on it for their drinking water. Thank you. Thank you. To our next question, which is, and I believe we start with Robert. What are you and your party prepared to do in order to improve rural broadband internet in York Simco? The CRTC is ancient. 
it's holding us back. We need to modify it to the point of even getting rid of it. We need competition. The uh, bandwidth that basically right now is running at about, I think, $100 to $150 per month. But then for every extra gigabyte, you have to pay another $5. This is causing families to ration out their bandwidth. And that isn't working out. Competition is the source. Uh, Maxine Bernier confesses that he is more of a libertarian uh, perspective when it comes to uh, him leaving the Conservative Party because he believes in free enterprise. And he's taking the view that if we simply get the CRTC out of the way, that basically the competition will come in and they will find a way to get uh, the bandwidth to the youth at lower and lower costs. The CRTC is an impediment. It is not, it, 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 it creates cartels, it creates benefits to the uh, status quo. It's hurting you. And this is the whole point of the People's Party. The, it, you've got to get rid of all of the regulation so that we can actually start saying, look, let us decide and let's hold each government uh, jurisdiction appropriately accountable. So that what we do simply in this case with the federal government is we say, is the CRTC really now progressive or is it a dinosaur from the past that needs to be maybe put out to rest? And the reality is right now, with, with the, the, the genius of technology, is that it's slowing us down. And it's creating some of the monopolies that are basically holding you back. So the, the solution from the People's Party is let you decide. Thank you. Now, after you Thank you. Yes, the internet is uh, essential to us all at this stage of uh, our lives. And, you know, I live in the rural communities. I live out in the country. Um, I know how <laughs> difficult it is to get connectivity at some points. I know how expensive it is. Uh, I deal with this uh, directly in my life. And the, the answer is we have to start developing more into the infrastructure for essential services. Uh, now, as a, from the federal level, this has got to go, you know, be done on a cohesive uh, venture with the provincial governments to try to help build up the infrastructure locally. But we, this is uh, something that we do need to start working on. And, you know, the, the, the cost is always going to be a question to my friend here, and it's going to be a question at all times. Again, if we start working towards cor uh, taxing the, the corporations and, and take them from the rich, we can give back to the poor. We can actually get more infrastructure built if we take back, the, get back to 2009 levels. And this is essential to getting the essential services that we need. So um, that would be my plan for getting to uh, the rural internet in this community. Thank you very much. Jessa McLean. So I think we can all acknowledge that uh, high-speed broadband is an essential service, uh, just like water and hydro uh, in terms of today's connectivity. But we are lacking in our community because of a lack of leadership and really short-term vision in our governments who are afraid to spend that huge amount of capital to get what needs to be done. I met with the mayor of Georgina just to understand how much, how much funds are needed, and it's astonishing. So we need a real commitment from the federal government. But because it's so essential, we should also really consider making it a public service. When do we leave such essential services to the private market? Um, and some parties, the Conservatives included, have suggested we work with the telecoms uh, with no real plan. And I'll tell you what happens when governments get into these private-public partnerships. We put in all the funds and they end up with the infrastructure and they end up making all the profits off it in the long run. So we need to look as a public entity how we are going to make that investment so that we can then in turn make the profits from it and ensure that everybody who needs the service gets it leaving it up to a big business to decide where it is profitable, which it is not in a lot of our communities, then it will never come here. And without the federal government's uh, li liberal or conservative willing to tax uh, the corporations and the ultra wealthy, I don't know where they're gonna get the money to do all of this from. I do. <laughs> Look, if you go for great Canadian gambler, I come up. And I was the 
professor at the Trump Taj Mahal in Atlantic City in the Rounders movie. So if anybody can show you how to win, I can. Now, if I got to reprogram the Bank of Canada's computer to give you all an interest-free account, and then put back the 60 grand Pierre helped the banks fleece from you, would you really have any trouble affording your internet? Thank you. Scott Davidson from the Conservative Party. Thank you. Uh, I would work with the private sector to find a solution, um, with government being a partner. I'm not interested in government becoming an internet provider. We don't need another public company. We have a challenge in rural Canada where the population density is low. It's currently a big disadvantage for business in these areas, particularly modern agriculture, who increasingly depend on high-speed connectivity. I know there's been many federal and provincial and even municipal pilot projects around the country to address this issue. I'd like a government to consider all options undertaken in Canada and we have to reach out around the world to find the best solutions for Canadians and people of New York Simcoe. Thank you. Sean Tanaka from the Liberal Party. Okay, so we don't need to reach out around the world. We can actually just look to what's happening. I agree with my MDP. Um, uh, friend here who says that we need leadership and commitment and that's exactly what the leader uh, the Liberal Party is delivering on. We have created a ministry for rural economic development that in the mandate letter, letter there was specific emphasis on making broadband a priority for rural communities like York Simcoe. 500 million dollars have been put in the Connect to Innovate fund. So what we do need is a progressive voice that can go to Ottawa and work alongside the government to make sure that this rural community, to make sure York Simcoe, isn't forgotten when it comes to this. We need to make sure that we have a slice of this investment right here. Because it's true, it's not just a privilege for a few, it's essential. And so that's why the Liberal Party has made it a top priority and is delivering on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. The next question will go to Matthew Lund of the Green Party. York Simcoe, and in particular Bradford, has a very strong and proud agricultural community. Uh, what do you and your party do uh, what will you and your party do to help farmers in this ride? Absolutely. And my, my uncle's a farmer in this area, and John Hodgson, who's been farming in this community now for more than 40 years. Agriculture is the backbone of this riding. Farmers locally are small business owners, and the Greens are the party for small business. What we can't keep having are mega industrial agricultural conglomerates coming in and taking over at the expense of the family farms. We need to invest locally in our agriculture. And we've got to keep environmental sanctions on it. We don't want to remove all of the environmental laws that we have just so that uh, certain parties can come in and turn the Holland Marsh into a series of condos. We need to focus and invest locally. We need to do this for our community. Thank you. Thank you. That's my plan, so the NDP has some really clear ideas of what we think farmers need, and if you're in the room, you can let me know if we're right or wrong. So we need to maintain the marketing boards, right? This is in order to protect farmers and guarantee the, uh, the security of the small farm. The Conservatives has abolished these in the past and uh, handed those interests over to foreign entities. So what's also happened is we're making really bad trade deals. When we go into trade deals, they can't be these huge, all-encompassing things. We need to focus on one sector at a time so that we can give it the attention that's needed. Uh, NAFTA, uh, something the NDP had nothing to do with, we, but we warned that this would happen, that we would see the wheat board go the way that it did, and we can do a lot better than that. The red tape, uh, this is the one time you'll hear me talking about advocating to get rid of red tape, because we need something like the national food policy that will help farmers. And this is where we're really lacking, and these are concrete examples of exactly what the NDP can do for farmers, not simply rhetoric and acknowledgement that you need help. Thank you, John. Well, of course, my answer is similar. And before you think I'm always picking on Pierre and the Liberals, this is the graph of the debt of France. 
And look, it started to grow exponentially in 1974, too. So it didn't matter who was in power. They would have all done it to you anyway because it was being done all over the world. But Pierre gets credit for being the poster boy for our national debt we didn't have to hold. As for farmers, if you count all of the interest they pay on all this big machinery and all their farms and on everything that they have to pass along to you in prices and hope they can collect out of you when you're complaining it's too expensive, back to the same problem. Pierre's interest made it too expensive for the farmers like it made food too expensive for you. And if we can just reprogram the bank's computers with the Spock solution, and let everybody have an interest-free account, they can cut their prices for food once they're not paying a fortune in interest on their equipment. Thank you, Scott Davidson from the Conservative Party. Thank you. I've known a lot of farm families in this riding, and uh, I've, I've been around this riding and spoke to many farmers. One uh, critical thing they reached out, uh, especially in Bradford, was interprovincial trade. There was relatively no lettuce growing uh, in the marsh uh, due to subsidies in Quebec, subsidies to trucking companies. And I think it's something that the federal government could actually reach out and sit down with the provinces and look at uh, interprovincial trade. Um, the other thing, again, is uh, infrastructure. A lot of farmers uh, burning propane at triple the cost of natural gas. Uh, the infrastructure isn't there for them. Um, as well as hydro. We have lots of farms still in phase one hydro. They don't have the uh, power they want to get into food processing, which I think is a, is a big opportunity for them, especially in the marsh. So I think we have to provide the infrastructure to help farmers in that way. Thank you. Thank you. So to all the farmers in the room, I just want to say thank you. And um, that it was Canadian Agricultural Day yesterday. So for those that don't know that, they should be thanking a farmer for making sure that they are celebrated for the contribution that they make to our communities. And so it's the Liberal Party that has always su um, supported supply management as well as its dairy farmers. Let's not forget that half of the Conservative Party voted for a leader that was ready to throw out uh, dairy farmers and kick them to the curb in an ideological commitment to free trade but it was the Liberal government who stood up to Trump when he tried to flood our market with an inferior product. So it is a Liberal Party that is committed to agriculture, to supply management, to the dairy farmers. And um, so again, just thank you to the farmers that came out tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you, Robert from the People's Party of Canada. To our constituents, I say, do you want more hypocrisy and betrayal? The situation is simply this. Um, supply side management is something that the People's Party is against. We're just against it because it basically, yes, it can help farmers, but it increases the price of eggs and poultry and milk and everything else for the rest of us. So we are opposed to supply side management and we're not going to uh, succumb to the, the desire to be um, ingratiated by a particular constituency. We can't continue to be hypocrites. Unfortunately, if we're for free uh, enterprise and competition, then we can't go around picking and choosing which um, uh, uh, industries we're going to basically artificially support. So if you want more betrayal, which is going to lead you to a very disastrous end, then please uh, ask us to be hypocrites and tell you what you want to hear. Unfortunately, I have to say on this one, no, we're not going in that direction. We are opposed to supply side economics. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of our candidates. We are now gonna take a, a breather because we're gonna move right into closing statements. So I'm gonna do a little plug for some of our events coming up while you guys get ready. How's that? Just a second. Um, coming up on March 11th, the BBT has Business Connections, the networking event at St. Louis Bar and Grill. It's at 6.30 uh, to 8 p.m. Uh, I also wanted to recognize that Ron Orr, Bradford Counselor, is in the audience. Thank you for coming, Ron. 
And if we're all ready, we are going to start with our closing statements. Candidates are ready? <laughs> Short breather, I said. <laughs> so, um, we will start with Jessa. I believe Matt answered the last question. So, Jessa McLean from the NDP. You have two minutes. Do we have a mic? Hello. There she is. All right. Jessica McClain from the New Democratic Party. Okay, so in politics and community organizing, my goal is always to inspire others to be bold, and that includes all of you, to work with your community and to fight for a world you know is possible, but I can't do this alone. And I also want to take the time to remind my fellow candidates that anything we do here cannot be a four-year mission. It cannot be about our careers or our party's ambitions for power. It has to be about the people, and not just voters, but their children, their environment, and the generations that will come after them. And I've spent a lot of time lobbying the government, petitioning the government, protesting the government for a more equal, just society. And to me, this means a world where no one is left behind. Now, earlier, Sean respectfully implied that protesting the government is somehow a bad thing. Let me remind you that protesting our government is how we women obtained the vote and made it possible to run for this office right here. It's how we recently, members of this community, protested and stopped Section 10 of Bill 66, which would have allowed developers to cut up our green belt. And protesting is how we, the NDP, ensured the Liberals even honored the small business tax they keep bragging about. In fact, it's how we achieved almost all of our rights in Canada, by protesting the government. Let your vote be a protest this time. My party doesn't have to win for me to be an advocate for you in Ottawa. This is not how government works. When Harper was in power for eight years, we had a conservative representative that did very little to address serious issues. So send a message this by-election that we know the system is not working for us. We reject austerity measures that aim at increasing the gap between the rich and the rest of us. Send a message that parties can't run on broken promises of electoral reform and indigenous uh, reconciliation. Send me to Ottawa so I can show you what a dedicated, passionate representation can do for you. Thank you, So I wear the hat as my only symbol, just in case you feel like laughing. Remember, you're laughing at a guy with a science degree trying to help you. Now, this was from 1981, an election then, when I was walking around with this sign. This is an equation. I've run in 98 elections because this equation proves that interest causes inflation. Can you believe our generation in the 80s were told that if we raised interest rates on manufacturers' costs, it would reduce prices? Come on, all you gray hairs out there. Isn't that true? Wasn't interest rates to fight inflation? And you fell for that? Raising manufacturing costs will reduce your prices? You believe that? I didn't. And I came up with this equation, which explained that inflation is a direct function of the interest rate. And that's why I ran in 98 Guinness record elections, because of an equation. Now, number two, I'm also leading the fight. Well, I ran in politics to legalize gambling because I got tired of being busted. Then they asked me about inflation. And I said, okay, my casino chips don't inflate. How come the government's chips do? And that's when I figured interest was causing it. But I was also in my first election called the cha champion of the gamblers, hookers, and dope smokers because I'm a libertarian at heart. And I'm still leading the fight to legalize marijuana and get you zombies off cams. So, in 2003, I made the government drop 4,000 charges. Of course, it didn't make the news. Like the meeting in Sutton last week, I got arrested and taken away because they wouldn't let me participate. And they covered it up. You didn't hear that the cops arrested a candidate and took him away from your election debate. And that's why you won't see me on the Rogers televised debate. So, yes, I'm a libertarian soul cred. I want no cops and gambling Thank you very much, John. Your time is up. Your closing statement, Dr. Davidson from the Conservative Party. Thanks very much. 
And thanks again to the organizers of uh, tonight's debate, the Breath Report of Trade and uh, Jennifer. And thank you to my fellow candidates. While we may not agree on the appropriate solutions to many of the challenges our community and country faces, I applaud you all for the desire to serve your community. Tonight you have heard from six local candidates who want to earn your vote. Six candidates representing different political parties and different visions for the future of our country. In an important by-election like this one right now, I believe it's in the interest to elect the MP who is ready to hit the ground running and start working hard immediately for the benefit of you and your family. I believe Canada is a great country and I believe under the leadership of Andrew Scheer and a new conservative government, we can, get, we can do a lot better. We owe it to our kids, our grandkids, to build the necessary conditions so Canada can remain competitive in an ever-changing global economy. Elected members must listen to input from all stakeholders and support decisions for the greater good. And I am confident that my experience in the private sector, my work ethic, and my strong relationships with leaders throughout the riding will assist me in becoming an MP that serves you, the residents of York Simcoe. On February 21st, vote Scott Davidson, 1T, your Conservative Party of Canada candidate. Thank you. Sean Tanaka from the Liberal Party. Thank you. So just before I start, the, the actual election day is February 25th, just so everyone knows. Okay, hopefully that didn't buy into my time. Um, you've come here tonight because you have a choice. And whether we agree of, of whether or not it was wasteful or not, this is where we are, right? You guys have this difficult choice to be made, and in short order, we'll be doing it again. So what I would ask of you is really consider who you think can be the strong voice for you and delivering things that York simply, York simply, simply needs. We haven't had a voice here for over six months. And arguably, we had an MP that was looking at an exit strategy and left his post early. What we need is somebody that understands that we need infrastructure here, like broadband, like our road train system. We need somebody that understands that families need to be supported at every level of and stage of life. We also need somebody that understands that there's more to do and that better is always possible. I increased the Liberal voter turnout by 400% in 2015, and I've picked up right where I left off. We've been knocking on doors, making calls, putting up signs, doing everything we can to earn your support, to hear the feedback that you have, the concerns that you have, the questions that you have, like you have tonight. And that's informing me so that I can go to Ottawa and work alongside the ministers, work alongside the Prime Minister, and give this feedback to make sure that in the short time that we have, only six months, that we can start to see some real change happening here in York St. Paul. So I too am somebody that uh, feels that I, I would be a great representative. Um, I'm a mother, I'm an educator, I'm somebody who is invested in this community, who has lived in this community, and has stuck around to do it for the second time because I care. So I want you guys to come out on February 25th and vote Sean Tanaka. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Robert, I know fiscal responsibility isn't very sexy, but the problem is this. We are headed towards this $1 trillion debt. We can't continue to allow our democracy to be a democracy of betrayal. Justin Trudeau lied to us so he could gain control of our finances. He told us, one, that it, the deficit would only be $10 billion. It ended up being 19 and growing. Then he told us, well, I'll balance it in four years. Well, that didn't happen either. And then he also lied to us about um, proportional representation. These sort of lies have led us down this road where finally now we are have no choices. Let me ask you, how is the government, conservative or liberal, ever going to pay that debt? Let me show you how dangerous everything is. The liberals changed the Income Tax Act in 2016. Remember how pompous Justin Trudeau was when he said it was 2015? 
Well, guess what? In 2016, he slipped into the Income Tax Act through regulation that now you have to report the profit of your personal residence, your personal residence exemption, should you sell your house. That's how they're going to pay this debt. They're coming after your homes. And then if we stop them, guess what? There'll be an inheritance tax. You have to be outraged now. Don't wait till the tax man shows up at your door demanding his cut of your house, because then it'll be too late. I know fiscal responsibility isn't sexy, but the reality is if you don't do it now, you're, we're going to pay for it later. Maxine Bernie has a five point plan. Get rid of the carbon, uh, sorry, yeah, get rid of the carbon tax, but then on top of it, get rid of capital gains so that basically we start our own uh, Thank you. I hope you've all been entertained by the theatrics tonight, but uh, this is actually a very serious election. This is actually a very serious time, and we need serious thoughts. After 40 years of liberal and conservative governments, they've left us with a declining middle class, students buried under crushing debt, the climate on the brink of collapse, and a social safety net that is in shambles. There's not time left for incremental change. Every environmental scientist is saying 10 to 12 years if we're lucky. He talks about an environmental or a climate, or a economic crisis. An environmental crisis is much more important. Um, our youth need the answers now. Our workers need to make a living wage. Our health care and our education system need to be built back up. And the uncontrolled greed and interference of the 1% need to be brought under control. Everyone I speak to says, They've lost faith in this system, that it's a corrupt, a corrupt system full of crooks, and that their vote doesn't count. I get that frustration because the other candidates up here are really being tasked to support their parties, not you. They're being asked to raise their hand every time their leader tells them to, not to support you. Except the Greens, because we're the only party that has it in our core principles, that we're to support the constituents of this, part, of this writing and not our party. We are not willing to whip our votes. We're the only party that is willing to have our entire budget reviewed by a parliamentary budget officer before and for approval before we are elected. We're the only party for the environment, and it's time for new blood in Ottawa to shake things up. You need an advocate. If you want to change, and that changes the Green Party, vote Matthew Lund to represent you in Ottawa, and vote Green for 2019. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of our candidates for coming tonight.